Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver and Anne Ball. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Countries have delayed action for too long and need to make deep cuts in their greenhouse gas emissions now. If they do not, they risk missing the agreed targets for limiting climate change, United Nations officials told reporters Tuesday. Inger Anderson is the head of the UN Environmental Program. She made the appeal just days before government officials head to Madrid for the yearly climate change meeting. We need quick wins to reduce emissions as much as possible in 2020, Anderson said. Her agency just released its yearly emissions gap report. The report showed that the amount of gases going into the atmosphere was the highest ever last year, even though most countries have promised to reduce them. Scientists believe a 7.6% drop in greenhouse gas emissions each year for the next 10 years would prevent many of the worst outcomes of climate change. Those outcomes include the loss of nearly all coral reefs and most Arctic sea ice. Even a lower target would require an emissions decrease of 2.7% each year between 2020 and 2030, the UNEP said. Katia Simeonova is with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. She told the Geneva News Conference, The world is facing a climate emergency. It cannot be solved by governments alone. 2020 is our last best chance. The head of the World Meteorological Organization said worldwide temperatures could rise by 3 to 5 degrees Celsius in the next 100 years if nothing is done to stop rising emissions. It is worth recalling that the last time the Earth experienced that level was 3 to 5 million years ago, WMO Secretary General Petri Tallis said. He added that at that time, sea levels were as much as 19 meters higher than now. UNEP released a separate report last week that looked at 10 fossil fuel producing countries. Researchers found those governments are planning to produce nearly double the amount of fossil fuels by 2030 than they should to meet the Paris Agreement's target. What countries are saying about supply doesn't add up with what they're saying about reducing emissions, said report co-author Michael Lazarus. He is a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute. The report includes the United States. The country claims to be reducing emissions even as its oil and gas businesses are growing. The report also looked at countries that are considered cooperative, like Norway. Norway continues to drill for oil in the North Sea. Officials appealed to governments that have already set their targets to see if they can do more. They insisted that industries like power, transport, building, and shipping can find ways to lower their emissions as well. Experts agree that the longer countries continue to use fossil fuels, the more a temperature increase will become certain. 
But the sooner countries take steps to stop depending on gas, coal, and oil, the more warming will be prevented in the long term. A bright, colorful wall of art is making over a once dark, uninviting passage under Tahrir Square in Baghdad, Iraq. We want a nation, not a prison, is the message of one painting of a man breaking free from jail. Another reads, Plant a revolution and you will harvest a nation. That painting shows a hand making a victory sign above the heads of protesters. Some of the messages are angry. Look at us, Americans. This is all your fault, declares one. The Sadun Tunnel has become an art space representing Iraq's massive anti-government activist movement. Along its walls, young artists draw murals, portraits, and messages that examine the country's tortured past and the country they hope to create for the future. Above the tunnel, Tahrir Square, is the center of the protest movement. Thousands of people occupy the square, making it seem like a small city itself. Security forces and protesters clash every day nearby. The troops use tear gas, bullets, and small sound bombs to prevent protesters from crossing the Tigris River. On the other side is the so-called Green Zone, the headquarters of Iraq's government. Tuk-tuks, three-wheeled motorized transports, often travel back and forth through Sadun Tunnel, taking wounded protesters to hospitals. The tunnel, the tuk-tuks, and the square are some of the symbols of the largest protest movement in Iraq's history. The demonstrations began October 1st. The activists were angry about corruption, unemployment, and a lack of basic services. Now they are demanding new leadership. Young protesters, both men and women, crowd the tunnel. The activists talk, take selfie pictures, and pass the time. Pictures on the walls mock Iraqi politicians. Other paintings honor the tuk-tuks and the protesters. One image shows a woman with an Iraqi flag painted on her cheek. She holds up her arm in a sign of strength. It is a recreation of the famous American We Can Do It propaganda poster. Haidar Mohammed said he and a group of other medical students are partly responsible for the murals. They saw the tunnel walls as a perfect medium to send a message to those who do not trust the protesters, he said. We are life makers, not death makers, he said. We decided to draw simple paintings to support our protester brothers and to express our message which is a peace message. Many of the murals carry calls for peace, a free Iraq, and an end to sectarianism. In one painting, a little girl cries, declaring, They killed my dream. Men, some in religious clothing, stand behind her. Another shows an Iraqi protester wearing a helmet. Its message in Arabic reads, In the heart is something that cannot be killed by guns, which is 
the nation. Nearby is written in English, All what I want is life. Yahya Muhammad praises the pictures that surround him in the Sadun Tunnel. Every time I look at them, I am hopeful that the revolution will not end, the 32-year-old said, adding, This tunnel gives me hope. I'm Katie Weaver. A California high school student recently took top honors at a worldwide science competition. Jeffrey Chen won the Breakthrough Junior Challenge Prize in science earlier this month. The prize comes with $250,000 that Chen can use for college. The aim of the Breakthrough Junior Challenge is to influence young people so they will think creatively in science and mathematics. Students ages 13 to 18 produce short videos which explain a complex science or math subject in an interesting way. The 17-year-old Chen was chosen over 14 other finalists from the United States, Canada, and India. The judges included several well-known scientists and educators. Among them were Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy, writer Lucy Hawking, and former astronaut Scott Kelly. Branko Malavar Vovodic, 18, of Peru, won the challenge's popular vote contest. He received more than 16,000 likes, shares, and positive reactions for his video on cryptography. You can watch it and the other videos on the Breakthrough Facebook page. In his prize-winning video on YouTube, Jeffrey Chen talks about neutrinos. This is a neutrino. You can't see or feel them, but every second each of us are bombarded by trillions of them. Chen explains, neutrinos are particles that are smaller than an atom. He talks about how they can be used in astronomy. Chen says they can help astronomers look at cosmic events. Neutrino astronomy is the next step in human discovery, and who knows what we'll find next. He says... The small particles may provide information about the earliest days of the universe. It's definitely really incredible to have won, and I have a hard time believing it, Chen told San Francisco television station KGO. I'm really grateful to be in an environment that promotes science. I think our school does a really good job of that. Chen is in his final year at Burlingame High School. He will share prizes worth a total of $400,000 with his school and science teacher. While he gets the $250,000 for college, his teacher, Heather Johnson, will receive $50,000. She helped him launch an environmental science club for students. His school will get a new science laboratory valued at $100,000. The competition was open to students from around the world. More than 11,000 students competed in the 2019 competition. There were two rounds of judging, the first by fellow students, followed by decisions made by a group of judges. The 30 semifinalists competed in the popular vote contest on Facebook. 
people were invited to vote for their favorite semifinalist's work by liking, sharing, or posting a positive reaction. During the 15-day competition, the 30 videos reached more than 500,000 people on the Breakthrough Prize Facebook page. Saul Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, partnered with the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. He praised Chen's science video. Jeffrey is a natural science communicator, Khan said. He artfully explains a complex topic and makes it easier to understand. We're proud to support Jeffrey and all the other bright minds who participated in the contest. A California newspaper, The Daily Journal, said the competition combined Chen's two great interests, astronomy and filmmaking. The high school senior told the paper that filmmaking is one of the most interesting ways to give an idea to an audience. Chen also said he hopes to continue combining his interests as he studies environmental technology in college. He wants to work on climate change. Videos made by the Breakthrough Junior Challenge finalists have been added to the Khan Academy website. I'm Ann Ball. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The battle between the North and the South spread in the summer of 1861. Union soldiers fought pro-Southern rioters in the streets of Baltimore and St. Louis. A Confederate supporter shot and killed a young officer from the North. Untrained soldiers from both sides fought in the mountains of western Virginia. So far, though, the fighting had not claimed many lives. But very soon, the battle would become fierce. Frank Oliver and Jack Weitzel continue the story of the American Civil War. The old general who commanded the Union forces... Winfield Scott, did not want to rush his men into battle. Scott believed it would be a long war. He planned to spend the first year of it getting ready to fight. He had an army of thousands of men, and it would get much larger in coming months. But this army was not trained. His soldiers were civilians, who knew nothing about fighting a war. General Scott needed time to make soldiers of these men. He also needed time to organize a supply system to get to his forces the guns, bullets, food, and clothing they would need. Without supplies, his army could not fight very long. There were many in the North, however who thought Scott was too careful. It was true, they said, that Union forces were untrained, but so were those of the South, and the Confederacy's supply problems were even greater than those of the Union. The South had much less industry and fewer railroads. It could not produce as much military equipment and it could not transport supplies as easily as the North could. In the early months of the war, Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, did not even have guns enough for the men in his army. Those who demanded immediate action expected a short war. They said Scott should take the army and march to Richmond. 
They were sure that if Union forces seized the Confederate capital, the Southern Rebellion would end. Northern newspapers took up the cry, On to Richmond! Political leaders began pressing for a quick Northern victory. Public pressure forced the army to act. For more than a month, General Irvin McDowell had been building a Union army in northern Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington. He had more than 30,000 men at bases in Arlington and Alexandria. Late in June, McDowell received orders. March against the Confederate Army of General Pierre Beauregard. Beauregard had 20,000 soldiers at Manassas Junction, a railroad village in Virginia, less than 50 kilometers from Washington. McDowell planned to move on Manassas Junction July 9th, but was delayed for more than a week. He planned the attack carefully. McDowell was worried that another large Confederate force west of Manassas Junction might join Beauregard's army. This force, led by General Joe Johnston, was in the Shenandoah Valley near Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Across from Harper's Ferry in Maryland was a Union army almost twice the size of Johnston's. It was ordered to put pressure on Johnston's force to prevent it from helping Beauregard. General Beauregard received early warning from Confederate spies that McDowell would attack. Much of his information came from a woman, Mrs. Rose O'Neill Greenhow. Mrs. Greenhow, a widow, was an important woman in Washington. She knew almost all the top government officials and she had friends in almost every department of the government. The beautiful Mrs. Greenhow also had some very special friends. One was Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts. He was chairman of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs. Another special friend was Thomas Jordan, a Confederate colonel in Beauregard's army. Jordan asked Mrs. Greenhow soon after the war started to be a spy for the South. She agreed and sent much valuable information about Union military plans. Early in July, she sent word to Beauregard that he would be attacked soon. She also sent a map used by the Senate Military Affairs Committee showing how the Union Army would reach Manassas Junction. Then, on the morning of July 16th, Mrs. Greenhow wrote a nine-word message. She gave it to a man to carry to Beauregard. The Confederate general received it that evening. It said, Order given for McDowell to march upon Manassas tonight. Beauregard sent a telegram to Richmond. He told the Confederate government that McDowell was on the way. He asked that Johnston's 10,000-man force in the Shenandoah Valley join him for battle. He was told to expect Johnston's help. But Johnston's army was threatened by a large Union force that entered Virginia from Maryland. Led by General Robert Patterson, the Union troops moved toward the smaller Confederate force. They were not really interested in fighting Johnston, but they did want to prevent him from reaching Beauregard. Johnston knew he could not defeat Patterson, so he decided to trick him. While most of his army withdrew and prepared to join Beauregard, Johnston sent a small force to attack Patterson's army. Patterson believed Johnston was attacking with all his troops. 
he stopped moving forward and prepared to defend against what seemed to be a strong Confederate attack. By the time the trick was discovered, Johnston and most of his troops were at Manassas. General McDowell's huge Union army left Arlington on the afternoon of July 16th. It was a hot day, and the road was dusty. The march was not well organized, and the men traveled slowly. They stopped at every stream to drink and wash the dust from their faces. Some of the soldiers left the road to pick fruits and berries from bushes along the way. To some of those who watched this army pass, the lines of soldiers in bright clothes looked like a long circus parade. Most of these men had not been soldiers long. Their bodies were soft and they tired quickly. It took them four days to travel the 45 kilometers to Centerville, the final town before Bull Run. The battle would start the next morning, Sunday, July 21st. The road from Washington was crowded early Sunday morning with horses and wagons bringing people to watch the great battle. Hundreds of men and women watched the fight from a hill near Centerville. Below them was Bull Run. But the battleground was covered so thickly with trees that the crowds saw little of the fighting. They could, however, see the smoke of battle, and they could hear the sounds of shots and exploding shells. From time to time, Union officers would ride up the hill to report what a great victory their troops were winning. In the first few hours of the battle, Union forces were winning. McDowell had moved most of his men to the left side of Beauregard's army. They attacked with artillery and pushed the Confederate forces back. It seemed that the Confederate defense would break. Some of the southern soldiers began to run. But others stood and fought. One Confederate officer, trying to prevent his troops from moving back, pointed to a group led by General T.J. Jackson of Virginia. Look, he shouted, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Fight like the Virginians. The Confederate troops refused to break. The fighting was fierce. The air was full of flying bullets. A newsman wrote that the whole valley was boiling with dust and smoke. A Confederate soldier told his friend, Them Yankees are just marching up and being shot to hell. Neither side would give up. Then a large group of Johnston's troops arrived by train and joined in the fight. Suddenly, Union soldiers stopped fighting and began pulling back. General McDowell and his officers tried to stop the retreat, but failed. Their men wanted no more fighting. The fleeing Union soldiers threw down their guns and equipment, thinking only of escape. Many did not stop until they reached Washington. It was a bitter defeat, but it made the North recognize the need for a real army, one trained and equipped for war. President Abraham Lincoln gave the job of building such an army to General George McClellan. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.